Amu Alam, Iman was the demon hunter. Takir! 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 Praise be to Allah. Dear beloved Muslim people who have gathered here, to your friends and supporters of AMCOP, Assalamu alaikum. <coughs> this is really a wonderful time for me and for us to meet here in Houston, Texas. And this facility here is a very nice facility. Uh, and the atmosphere here is very good. You know, uh, they say those, those animals that have lived in their natural habitat, they're more sensitive than animals that have been uh, taken out of their natural habitat and raised in an unnatural environment. And I think I live in the natural habitat. And believe me, I'm very sensitive. And when I walked in here, I said, oh, this is going to be all right. <laughs> Praise be to Allah. Praise be to Allah. Really wonderful. I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, the honor that you have uh, extended to me to invite me here to address you on this occasion. I want to speak for a few minutes on a thought that I think is a very productive thought. And uh, I find this idea in our holy book, in the Quran, and I find it in the wisdom of the ancient, not only in our holy book, but I find it in the wisdom of the ancient. I believe it goes back to our first ancestor, who's uh, called Adam. And that is a belief in staying in touch with your potential. Your ability. That's a very productive idea. Very productive idea. Many people are successful in life and it's because they are conscious, they are conscious of their potential. They live with a conscious awareness of what they can do. Potency is power. Potential is a capacity to produce, to manifest power. Now, <clears throat> the difference between the people who succeed in life and the people who fail is just that. The failures go on not aware of their potential, not aware of their capacity to produce. Allah intend that we be aware of our potential, that we be aware of our power, that we be, that we be aware of our capability. Allah intend that we be aware of this. For Allah has told us in many places in Quran, in the Holy Book Quran, Allah has told us in many places of our excellence, of our capability. 
And once we recognize that, once we come face to face with the wealth of resources that we have in our own being and really see it, but no one has to motivate us anymore. No one has to push us and drive us to where we have to go anymore. We are a living soul from that moment on, and we function without being driven. That's freedom. And anyone who has come into that kind of realization and have realized that that was a mercy or a blessing of God, to them, because you don't come into that by conscious effort. You just wake up one morning and that strikes you. It dawns on you. The thought hits you out of nowhere. Because what you need to work with is right in your own hands. And from that time on, you are a moving being in this world. I feel an urge to tell people about their own power. Because I believe if they ever accept that fact that they themselves are the greatest resources Allah has created. then the burden will be light for all of us. Anytime we have to come and wake up everybody <laughs> and then walk up and down the, 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 the hall with them right. until they're able to stand up without falling. Right. Boy, that's trouble. Right. That's hardship. That's a setback. Yeah, and those people who are out there just making headway, they are laughing at our condition. Say, look at them, they're going down there to give them another pep talk. They got to wake them up again. But those who become conscious of their own work that God created them with, you don't have to wake them up over and over. You don't have to start from point one every time they meet them. So well, the magnet has lost this magnetism again. So let us magnetize it so we can use it. That's a lot of work. But those who stay alive, you just say, hey, it's time to go to work again. Work. Some of them you come and say, hey, it's time to go to work. Say, hey, you have, you, uh, did you go to bed last night? I see you working. They don't have to even be told it's time to go to work. They feel the need. They feel the need, and they don't wait to be called. They say, well, here's the need, and I got time to do some work now. I'm going to take advantage of this time that I got and put it to good use. Do some constructive work. So work to advance the people in the good way, you see. Potential, conscious of one's potential. You know, the white man has succeeded in this world, and he's gotten ahead of most people in this world because of that reality. The white man is conscious of his potential. The white man is conscious of his potential strength, of his potential resources. The white man is, I don't mean all white people, I said the white man. <laughs> the white man is always studying new ways to get more out of his resources. Human resources, mental resources, spiritual resources. And we have to become like that. When we become like that, then we join the world of men. We join the world of men. 
when we become conscious of the power, the resources that we have within ourselves, we join the world of men. Now, some of you say, oh, what the imam suggesting is deep, profound, <laughs> heavy. We're going to need somebody to go to school. Ten Harvard, Yale. And find a way to put this idea into reality the Imam is talking about. No, you got energy. You got energy. You get up in the morning, you got energy. Okay, don't waste it. That's all we're talking about. Energy is a resource. That's something you got. So you get up in the morning with that energy, don't waste it. Put it to some constructive use. Say, oh, well, I work 40 hours a week. For what? <laughs> if you're the average person, you're walk, working 40 hours a week to eat, to sleep, and to have sex. <laughs> and to have fun. Animals eat. Animals sleep. Animals have sex. Animals play. I want something more than that. I want to do something that animals don't do. And animals don't influence the course of life. Animals don't lead the developments in life. I would like to lead the developments in life. I would like to be responsible for taking people out of the animal group of just being satisfied to eat, sleep, have sex, and have some fun. And change the whole picture of their life from that to the image of man. That's what I would like to be instrumental in doing. You see? So to me, to me, that's living. To me, that's being alive as a person. And I can't think of myself living like the average person lived today, except in the grave. <laughs> yeah, whenever I, if I think of myself just living as the average person lives, I see myself dead. You know, the blood has stopped in the vein. The skin has lost its glow. And the soul, the, the soul is gone. The body has no expression. There's nobody in this vessel anymore. That's the way I see myself when I think of myself just going to a 40-hour job, just so me and my wife and my children will have a house and have some more food and some, something to drink and TV and some record play, some records in the house spinning or so, or, or some tape and a, a chance to dance and play, you know, or go out and see a movie or go see a show and come back home and rest up that night so we all can go back to the work and go to school then Monday to continue that life, to will that life to our coming sons and daughters. I see that as no better than the life of a dog, rat, cat, mosquito, roach, snake, experience. They all have that experience. So, but we got our families. They got their families too. And I find some of those animals take more, have more delight in their families than we do. We have to, if we are a higher species, if we are a higher creation, then we should find a plane, that plane for our own self. Where is that plane for myself? That plane for myself can't be on that animal level. 
Allah says, let there arise out of you a group of people calling to all that is good, prohibiting all that is bad, believing in God, loving him, not fearing the criticism of those who criticize it, who, of those who criticize it. You know, to me, that's, to me that's saying, let there rise up a special people. A special people. That are special because they have a special vision. Because they have a special idea of what life is all about. Because they have a special goal, a special aim in life. Let them rise up a special people and then let them be satisfied with their own company so that they are not affected by what people say outside of their company. Let them be satisfied with their own company so that they won't have to compromise their life so that they won't have to shed off some of their own characteristics, some of their own identity. They won't have to give up some of their own principles to be accepted. Let there rise up a group of people, a small group of people, that'll be a world within themselves. Where they won't have to feel lonely anymore. And let them live their own unique life and let them pursue their own special goals. <laughs> That's the way I see it. That's the way I see it. You know, and I'm telling you, before I understood this, that was a heavy burden on me. I'm not Jesus Christ, but I felt that I walked with that heavy cross. Because I actually believe that what God has revealed must be given to everybody and our, our responsibility, our duty is to work on everybody to get them to accept it. That was my belief. Believe me, that was the most miserable time of my life. Because I talked to a big field of dead folks. And they couldn't distinguish between light and darkness, between filth and cleanliness, between intelligence and foolishness. And I wonder how come they couldn't respond. And I say, I have to keep trying. And I would come out again, start all over again. I said, every time I find these people, they're in the same shape I left. I preach and preach and preach and I get a response. Everybody say, yeah. Right, Chief. And I go back home, come back and see them maybe three, four months later, and they're right where I found them the first time. Same dead folk. And then I have to preach and preach and preach, and after a while I get that response. Yeah, Chief. Some of them say, you told us that the last time you were here. <laughs> I said, my Lord, how can we work this thing out? <laughs> say, am, I, am I going up a hill that has no summit? <laughs> Will I say, ever be climbing? <laughs> I didn't know. And Allah blessed me with insight. Then look, have you been overlooking the words of God that are repeated so often in the Quran? It starts off with, It starts off separating the people. This is the book in which there is no doubt, guidance for the God-fearing. Now, I know everybody don't feel God. But this book is not for everybody. God is for the God-fearing. I say, well, look, Lord, thank you very much. 
that's been my problem. I've been out there trying to get a response from the people that don't fear God. I've been out there spending more time with the people that don't respond to God than I've been spending with the people who fear God. So I said, well, thank you very much. I said, I'm going to let, let them know the next time I speak to them that I'm not interested in those that are not interested in you. Then again, he says that God caused the rain to fall and water all the plants alike or all the earth alike. But up from that spot where the water fell come up things good and things niggardly. Things good and things selfish. Selfish things. God's reign was charity. But his charity didn't produce all charitable life. Some life came up that want to give good. Other life came up that want to choke and take. And he says, never will he let the believers alone. God is bothering us. Never will he let the believers alone until they be separated. That that is disease from that that is healthy. That that is habitha from that that is sighted. I said, my Lord, this is wonderful to understand. This takes a lot of burden off my back. So I said, now I'm going to make a point of telling these folks that I ain't out here to win the friendship of no immoral person who have set their mind to being immoral. But I'm out here to try to make friends with people like me that appreciate moral life and haven't committed themselves to immorality. Oh, I'm telling you, the burden went off. The burden went off. When I began to see these distinctions and began to understand that God didn't send the prophet to the wicked, <laughs> he sent the prophets to the people who were in a wicked condition, but they were righteous in their heart. And they were just waiting for the light so that they'll have a way to come out of their wickedness. In other words, God sent the prophets to well-meaning people, not to people who had fixed their hearts on being wrong. When a person has fix, fixed their, his heart on being wrong, he is a son of Satan. Now, what can you do with the children of Satan but stay away from them if you're wise? I begin to recognize another distinction. I said, God says that he calls us to the light and Satan calls us to the darkness. I said to myself, and he says that he has created the day so that we'll have vision, sight to see things and for our activities. I said to my, my Lord, now these people who follow Satan in the darkness, they don't have guide posts. They don't have direction for their activities. So their activities may be one thing today and something altogether different tomorrow. There is no permanence in what they do. So I say, thank you, Lord. I'm going to let these people know that I'm not the friend of those who love foolishness. That I'm the friend of those who respect intelligence. See, we have to separate people because people are not all alike. And don't think the masses are the people that we expect the inferiority to be in. No. The inferiority is mostly in those people that are ruling the masses. 
And that's why the world is in the condition it is in. It's because the weak people are ruling the world. Strong or not weak and ruling the world, the weak are ruling the world. Oh, yes. So I said to myself, boy, oh boy, it's wonderful to be able to see what God wants. Because we can be overambitious in our innocence. We want to just save everybody. And we think that everybody should be able to see the right. And I read in the, in the Quran, Allah says, can you give hearing to those who are deaf? They're deaf. To those who are deaf. Can you give sight to those who are blind? Now we know the Bible is dead. Scripture has said that God missioned prophet of Jesus and uh, Elijah and Elisha. And those people healed people who had these problems, you know. They couldn't see and with the blessing of God, they were able to give sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf and speech to those who could speak. But here God is saying, if I'm Muhammad, do you think you can give this to the people? Can you give life to those who are dead in the grave? The question is being asked. What is the answer? No. No. God has not given any human being the power to give hearing to somebody that can't hear, a sight to somebody that can't see, a speech to somebody that can't talk, a life to somebody that's dead. Allah hasn't given that power to anybody. In order for that to happen, there must be a desire on the part of the person to see, to hear, to speak, to live. If there's not a desire in that person for that, impossible. That's what God is telling us. So I said to myself, boy, we've been wearing ourselves and working our brains out and wearing ourselves out while these people have been laughing at us. So, hey, try it again, brother man. Come on, teach us, teach us for seven hours again, brother man. I'd like to see you work out. having that fun while we beating our brains out and spending all of our energy on people who just came to see us frustrate ourselves. So I said to myself, no more. God has blessed me to see and I'm going to respect, respect sight, intelligence. I'm not going to worry my heart anymore over people who have made an oath to be wrong. They've taken an oath to be wrong. Yeah. So I'm just here to tell you that your imam ain't burdened no more. His back feel good. Back in good shape. <laughs> Praise be to Allah. Praise be to Allah. Now, let's get back to that thought that I said is a productive thought. If you can be conscious of the fact that in you are great resources, great resources for great production, great production, then use your energies wisely and realize that if you neglect your own energy, your own resources, then you are not going to be in an easier situation. You are not going to make your future better. When you neglect yourself and neglect your own resources, you are putting in your own future difficulty. You are putting in the path of your own destiny difficulty. You are straining your life. You are not easing your life. When you ease your life, you are working to get the best out of what you got. That's when you're easing your life. You're making life easier for yourself then. You know, take a lesson from nature. I have come out on a day when the, the heat just came. It's been cool, you know, or 
temperature has been around 65 and 70, not over 75. Didn't have to be under no bad condition or under the suffocating heat. And all of a sudden now, the heat is 98. Came outside 98 degrees, I can't stand it. I don't like the heat that hot. I don't like to be that hot. Can't stand it. But after heat stays, heat stays. Sometimes we have a heat wave in Chicago and won't let up. <clears throat> so the heat stays. Second day, miserable. Third day, miserable. But a little less miserable. Fourth day, a little less miserable. Fifth day, feels like it's about 80. And it's still 98. What has happened? Your systems have adjusted to the condition. Now, let me tell you something. White people know this. Excuse me, the white man knows this. What has happened? Your system has adjusted, right? So now what used to be very hot on you is not that hot anymore, right? Now, what, I'm, what I want to tell you is this that learned people know that the white man understands. Some other people understand too, but very few. And that is it, that your whole life operates like that. Even your spirituality operates like that. If you let yourself get into a silly mood, and you stay into that silly mood, and your conscience is telling you, this is, this is beneath your dignity. Cut out this foolishness. But you stay in that silly mood. The longer you stay in that silly mood, the more your being will adjust to that mood. And after a while, that mood ain't silly to you no more. People wonder and say, look, I, 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 I they say, man, what, what in the world happened to Mary? <laughs> Mary didn't used to be crazy like that. So you know, you can't even shame that girl no more. To me, to me, that's worth a billion dollars. For me to know that about myself, to me, is worth a billion dollars. I'd rather have that knowledge than to be made rich, materially rich. Because if I'm materially rich and don't have that knowledge, look how vulnerable I am. But with that knowledge, man, I think that's wealth. Allah says, God against extremes. God against extremes. He says, this is a midway community. Midway means a community that never gives itself to the extreme. To me, that's precious knowledge. Okay, so I have, I have the resource, the most precious resource I have is my nature, right? right. Nature is your most precious resource. In fact, whatever we have as resources, they are all developed out of natural resources, right? Whatever we have as resources, they are all developed as out of natural resources. We don't have any resources that don't have, that, 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 that don't have their origin in natural resources. I don't care whether it's your thoughts or whatever it is, your, your knowledge, your science, I don't care what it is. It all goes back to natural resources. Now, so the nature is the most precious natural, the most precious resource I have. That's my nature. Now, if I have some knowledge of my nature, that will help me preserve myself in the world so that I am not wiped out by developments in the culture or developments in the, in the, in, in, in the society, then I think that's worth a billion dollars. That's worth everything. That's worth more money than you can give me. Because if I practice that by myself, I don't have to go out and convert the world. If I practice that by myself, one of my children, perhaps two, maybe even three, will adopt my attitude and behavior. And if that happens, there's hope for the life that God wants on this earth. God wants a life that conforms to the excellent mold that he created the human being in. God doesn't want creatures who just blend in with every freakish image the world put out here for them to imitate? No, God doesn't want that kind of people. God wants people who look at the 
the, at the image that the world is inviting them to conform to and say, I know that's beneath me. I don't want it. Sell that to somebody else. I'm gone. See, I have my concept of myself. I know what I want to look like today and a billion years from now. I'm not shopping for a picture of myself. The, aver the average miserable creature in this society is shopping for a picture of themselves. Because they don't know themselves. They don't know the self that God made excellent. They don't know the self that God made rich. Capable of, capable of doing wonders. They don't know that self. So they can't, they can't appreciate the self that they are now no longer than we appreciate it. The moment a good number of us began to look at them and show no excitement, they don't impress us anymore, they get fed up with themselves. Oh, nobody is paying any attention to me anymore. I have to shop for a new thing. And they go shopping for a new thing, shopping for a new personality, shopping for a new look, right? They are not constant people. They don't know who they are. They don't know who they are. So every time there's no reception, the reception is lost and nobody wants them anymore, every time they lose their own lookers, they become sick and miserable. <laughs> so what's wrong with you, pretty girl? <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Just one old look is enough to bring her back to life. <laughs> oh, nothing. Hi, where you been? you really brightened up my day. <laughs> what you mean you really brought me back to life? I was dying because nobody was looking at me. <laughs> but when you come into the, to the, to the real knowledge of yourself and the great work that God has deposited in you when he created you, oh, you don't feel lonely. You don't hunger for attention. Hunger for somebody to be looking at you and praising you? You don't want that. That doesn't move you. You live in the spirit of gratitude, spirit of appreciation. You live thanking God for saving you from the deformed, miserable cuss that you see all around you. Say, God, you could have deformed me like you did that bastard. I thank you for not deforming me. <laughs> yes, yes, you live, you live in a spirit of happiness and appreciation, and thankfulness, thanking God that you are not one of those people who can't be happy unless somebody is praising them. You know that people like that, and if they can't find nobody to praise them, they will go twenty miles to a mirror. <laughs> You wonder what he's looking for. You think he's shopping for clothes or something. No, he's shopping for a mirror. When he find that mirror, he... he become his own admirer. Break all the mirrors, he go crazy. That's sick. But that's the condition we fall into when we don't accept the guidance of God. Dear beloved people, again I say to you, we have to be conscious of our own potential. Conscious of what we are capable of producing. I have energy. I can put it to work. There's no job available. No job available to me. But I have energy that wants to be put to work. Now, what am I, a creature that can't live without a, 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 a regimentation, without somebody driving me, ordering me, telling me what to do? No. God has created me to join organizations, to join operations, to join in the system, 
but God has also created me to think my way out of inaction. Think my way out of idleness. God has created me to think my way out of death into life. Out of non-productivity into productivity. Well, look at the thousands of people who are self-employed. Never work for any other boss. All they know is self-employment. But we who've gotten so used to punching the clock, waiting for the man to hire us again, or to turn the juice on again at the machine, at the plant, we have forgotten that we are a generator ourselves, that we can initiate action. We can plan our way out of our idleness. And we can organize ourselves so that the idol become a force for the, those that hire and fire to reckon with. To me, that's what AMCOP represents. It represents an opportunity for people who are made idle to come together with the spirit and determination, faith in their own ability, faith in what they can do to come together and say, let us idle people become a force to be reckoned with. I have many resources. I got energy to put to work. I got needs to employ. Don't let other people employ your needs all the time. You have to eat. Somebody's employing your needs. Or we may say exploiting your needs. But I like this, I, this, this expression, employing my needs. You are employing my needs. Well, hell, what are you doing employing my needs? I want to employ my own needs. Now, well, that makes me equal to you. See, when I start thinking that way, I become equal to any other free man. So I want to employ my own needs. So, okay, I need to eat. I want to put that to work. Say, hey, man, how in the world are you going to put the need to eat to work? <laughs> I'm going to make up my mind that I'm not going to eat from you if I can eat from my own hand. Then I'm putting my need to work for myself. I'm putting my need to work. I think that's what Adam Cop is saying again. Say, look, we have a need for clothes. Let us employ our own needs so that we are not exploited in these idle days or idle time, idling time. <laughs> yeah, so they're saying, let us employ our own need. We need clothes? Okay, let us employ that need. So okay, there's a need standing there. It has nothing to do but wait on the white man to call it into action. <laughs> so let us employ that need, because the white man ain't interested in it until he needs it. And as long as he can find a way to get around it, he will get around it. Well, ain't nothing wrong with that. I want to be just like him. I want to find a way to get around asking him to come in and take something out of my neighborhood. As long as I got a brother to take it and say, hey, can you use that and let it stay in the neighborhood, brother? He said, yeah. Okay, well, let's do it, man. So we want to get around the man taking all of our goods out of the neighborhood. The neighborhood is a resource, isn't it? The neighborhood is a great resource. <clears throat> In that neighborhood, you have energy for production, energy for work. In that neighborhood, you have needs, many needs. Who are tapping those needs? Who, who is giving attention to those needs and then investing in those needs? It's the outsider. Right? That's right. That's right. 
I was reading in a <coughs> report today, report by one of our fine organizations. They are very useful to us because <coughs> they study the problem, they study the situation for blacks, and then they report to us on these situations so that we'll be better able to deal with the problems we are faced with today, the problems we have, the situation we have uh, uh, find ourselves in. <coughs> so I value these organizations. But sometimes I wonder, have they got caught in a groove? And have they have found uh, some kind of sexual satisfaction in just finding a new fact and telling the people? Yes, in the first quarter of 1983, there was 18% of the whites unemployed of those that are employable compared with 36% of the blacks. <laughs> what, the, what, what, what are we cheering? That ain't nothing to cheer. So hell, you sure put a lot of depressing information on us today. <laughs> now what are we going to do about it? How are we going to change this situation? Well, we have to get this information to the White House. We have to let the Congress know that we can't tolerate this. <laughs> As not. <laughs> and they tell me he was a great president. They say he was a great president. I believe it. But I don't know who he was talking to. Seemed like he talked over most of the people. <laughs> you know, we have to stop that treat to the White House. Going down to see the man again. Every time there's a situation that bothers us, let's go tell the man about it. You know, are we still on the plantation? No, sir. If something goes wrong, go tell Malcolm. <laughs> I can understand it there, because master will punish you for taking authority upon yourself. But now I'm supposed to be free. With the same freedom that all other Americans have. So the master shouldn't punish me or penalize me for taking my own situation in my own hands. Now, if we continue to follow our preaching politicians, preacher politicians, that's what they are. If we continue to follow our preacher politicians to the White House, or to Congress, or to, to, to Mr. Reagan, yeah, we got to let Reagan know this. <coughs> you see, Reagan can tell you more about it than you know. He's well informed. We have to stop doing that, because that makes us look ridiculous. First, see what we can do. He said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. That's the difference between those that have to be ordered around and those that are ordering people and things around. Yes, those that say, what my country needs. What my country needs. Do you think you're too small to think that way? You as big as any creature God has made. So we should ask, what America needs? And don't you know if the black people stop being so racially selfish and stop talking about what black people need and start asking what my country needs. If we can accept the, the, the burden of this country upon our own shoulders, Shouldn't the burden of a country be upon the shoulders of every citizen of that country? Certainly. We know all won't be able to carry it because all don't have the mind to respect it. But those that have the decency to respect such noble idea, they will be prepared to shoulder their country, carry their country on their own shoulders. 
But if you carry a country upon your shoulders, you want to know what your country needs. And when you stop to ask the question, what my country needs, it will clear your vision. Your vision will clear up. And then you'll be able to attend your own needs. And your country needs strength. And if you've got 30 million African-American people with a habit of crying out to the white man every time they have difficulty as a people, then you've got a people who are still suffering a compulsion to cry to somebody else like a baby. You've got a dependent people on your hands. You've got a dependent people on your hands. You know what that means, a dependent? That means somebody else takes care of them. Every time we fill out our income tax, you say, how many dependents you have? How many dependents you have? Every white person should say 30 million, I think. <laughs> That's a shame. If you're going to cry to them, cry to them for a way out of all your problems, then they have 30 million black dependents. But we shouldn't accept that situation. No, indeed. But realize that you have the same resources that everybody else has. You're capable of doing whatever that anybody else can do. And that if you use your resources, your spirit improves. Your life becomes more livable. That is your way to fulfillment. If you want to fulfill yourself, and everybody want to fulfill themselves, say, so oh, let the child fulfill herself. <laughs> if she wants to walk a tightrope, don't bother her. Let her practice walking a tightrope. She must fulfill herself, dear child. Right? Yeah, you know, we don't get what they want to do. Oh, let them, let them shoot that in his face. He's going to be happy. That's his form of happiness. That's his idea of happiness. Let him fulfill himself. Right? Look, somebody must believe that way. If they didn't believe that way, dope wouldn't be so prevalent. Dope fiends wouldn't be so prevalent. Right? Yeah, if they didn't believe that that man was entitled to make his choice, that's my choice. I want to. I, I want to. I want to. I want to dream mm -hmm. for the rest of my life. <laughs> so I'm taking morphine or whatever it is. So that's my choice. They say, uh, 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 members of Congress, <laughs> this uh, dope problem is becoming an, ep an epidemic. Well, uh, will you please um, uh, uh, allocate some money for a research team? to go and study this problem. See, how much? Oh, uh, the, the, well, well, I think maybe five billion. At least, at least 500 million. Okay, all right, okay, we allocate 700 million for this project. And now let's go and study the, the dope fiend. So they all that good taxpayers' money. Right? Right. And maybe one of the members of Congress could have told them. <laughs> All that money spent, and then they get a program. Program uh, for dope fees. So, well, well, uh, well, we got this program. It's been operating now for five years. Then we still have the same problems. Dope addicts are just increasing and increasing at the same rate, and even more so. So we don't worry about it. Say, don't we have people employed? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, we are employing people to handle the dope problem. So we don't worry about it. Say, well, can't we stop this? Stop it. That's on America. <laughs> Say, we can't stop it. This is a free society. A man has to be left alone to make his own choices. If that's the life that he chooses to live, then we must allow it. 
Please don't stop all the dope from coming into the city. We'll lose our democracy. We have to give an opportunity, a dope scene an opportunity to use his dope. Now that sounds perhaps far-fetched to you all. Perhaps sound way out and ridiculous. But that's reality. That is reality. Do you think this country doesn't have power to keep dope out of this country? Don't they have power to keep niggas out of business? Don't they have power to keep niggas out of progress? They got power to keep blacks from being economically established. If they got the power to keep blacks from power, they keep blacks out of power. They got power to keep blacks from organizing their life. If they got the power to keep blacks from controlling their own neighborhood. If they got the power to take our teenagers away from us, away from mom and daddy, and turn our teenagers against us, and make them, make, make them appear to us as strangers we never saw in our lives, foreigners from another world. If they got the power to do all of that and allow all that, and if they got the power, if they got the power to when they want to, 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 uh, to, to stop even the mafia. Mafia make too much trouble during the wrong season. The feds come down on the mafia. Right. And make the, make the mafia go in his house and become a husband, become a father. They can go on back home and become a family man. Or lock him up forever. They got the power to deal with these things, these great forces. If they got the power to choke the Caribbean until the Caribbean say, please, I had enough. I'm ready to make a deal. If they got the power to keep El Islam out of the black community. Yes. Well, you, don't you know, if, if it wasn't for forces working to keep this religion out of the black heart, man's heart in this country, that this religion would already be the religion of the black people in this country? Any intelligent man, if you would put the two religions on each side of the board, or what, put the, one, the, our religion on one side of the board, put the religion that you people follow that are not Muslim on the other side of the board, and let any intelligent man say, which one of these religions both serve the needs in the life of the American black, black? Any intelligent person would say, this religion they call, what is that, Islam? Say, that's the one that best serves the needs of the black. responding to it, it's because this power we call America, this power has the power to keep black hearts from responding to Islam. This powerful environment or country we call America, it has the power to keep black out of the carriage. to establish themselves, to command respect in their home. We don't have no respect in our home. We don't command respect in our home. We don't have the terrorists. We don't have the terrorists to tell America, look, Christianity was given to us from you.